Station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, this is Station. I'm ready for the event. BBC World News. This is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Okay. Hello, sir. Can you hear us? This is BBC World News. Luca Palmitano. Hi, it's Ros Atkins at the BBC. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you okay. Fantastic. That's very exciting. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. How long have you got left on the ISS? First of all, welcome on board the space, the space, the space station and inside the Columbus uh, European module. Uh, I've been here for about four months and I have seven weeks left. Well, we appreciate your time. We're going to start recording the interview now if it's okay. Could you start by showing us around the room that you're in at the moment? Could you explain what's around you? Yes, with pleasure. So right now here we are um, in the Columbus module. Columbus is the European lab, uh, which is uh, the European contribution, the European Space Agency contribution to the International Space Station. We are at the very front of the space station. The, this is the direction of flight, my right, and it's called forward. This is aft. And what you see around me, uh, we call this the deck, uh, and this is the uh, overhead, and. Uh, Around me are racks. The racks are, uh, are labs in, in, in itself. So uh, to my right, there is a European drawer rack. Uh, this one is basically a modular uh, rack where you can install different kinds of experiments, and the, the, the rack will provide energy and data to, to them. Uh, to my left, and a similar concept, this is an American rack called the Express. Uh, this is the BioLab, which is the European a lab for biology experiments. And then uh, behind me, other different kind of, of racks, also for experiments. Uh, this one is working right now is for uh, fluid physics. And uh, also uh, behind me, uh, uh, two racks for human physiology experiments. Well, thank you very much indeed for the tour. Let me ask you about what happened with that spacewalk a few weeks ago, because lots of our viewers were very concerned about you. Tell us the moment that you realized that there was a problem. Sorry, it, uh, no, every, every spacewalk is an adventure, and uh, mine ended up being a special adventure. And what happened is that um, I, was, uh, I was outside, I'd been outside for about 40 minutes uh, uh, doing one of the tasks. And I was about to complete my second task when I felt some cold water in the back of my head. Now, since I don't have any hair, uh, that cold sensation was very strong. And I realized that uh, something didn't feel right. I contacted ground, uh, telling them that I, I felt this water, I felt cold water behind my, my head, and I didn't think it was either sweat. I didn't think it came from my uh, DIDB bag, which is the bag that we use right in front to drink water during an EVA. Uh, at, the, uh, at that moment, my, uh, my, my colleague, uh, Chris Cassidy, was already out, was outside with me. He finished his uh, task and came towards me to check my helmet, and he noticed the water crawling towards the front of my, of my visor. Uh, it started covering my eyebrows and my ears, and that's when ground very promptly called uh, terminate, which means we stop where we are, and we go back inside and uh, repress uh, the, the airlock. So I did that. I started, walk I started moving towards uh, the airlock. In the meantime, the water kept crawling to the front of the helmet. The problem in, in uh, zero G is that the water... Uh, just uh, creates a glob and doesn't flow. So it just kept accumulating until it covered, completely covered my ears and my eyes, and then finally even my nose. So I was only left with my mouth to breathe, uh, which luckily it, it, it never, the water never reached my mouth. I, I was always able to breathe through my mouth. I just couldn't hear or couldn't see anything. Uh, but thanks to the training and thanks to the support from the ground, 
uh, the, all the engineers and the, and the, the ground support people that helped me, they guided me back. They got me back inside the airlock, pressurized very quickly the airlock. Uh, the crew on, on board, uh, Karen Nyberg, she was at the, she had the controls for the repressurization. She did an excellent job uh, keeping uh, keeping us updated on on the state of the uh, of the repressurization. And uh, in in few minutes, really, the emergency was solved. Uh, now, for me, those were very long minutes, but I was always confident the whole time uh, that uh, Chris. Uh, was there to help me, and that the ground was there to help me, and the crew on board always was always there to help me. Well, Luca, thank goodness you're okay. It sounds absolutely terrifying. You sound far calmer uh, when you talk about it than I think most of us would have felt. Now, we've been telling uh, the people who follow us on Facebook that you were speaking to us here on Global, and they've been leaving lots of questions for you. I wonder if I could ask you a couple. Um, Thomas would like to ask you, how far do you go from the ISS when you go on a spacewalk? How's the, what's the furthest you can go? So when we go outside, we, are never, we, we never leave contact with the, with the space station. We're always in contact with the structure. So we come out of the airlock, and we have cables. They're called safety tethers. They, they, Kind of like the ones that you use with little dogs to let them uh, move around and then and then get back. They, uh, they, they, you know, you can get them long, and they are 85 feet long. And so technically, we could only go about 185 feet away from the airlock, which is where we position ourselves. However, we have tricks that we do in order to go farther away, which is all the way, if we want, all the way to the to the end of the truss, which is about 100 meters wide. And in order to do that, anchor different uh, safety tethers, we call them packs, so that we always have a way back, we always safely attach the station, and, uh, and we can go all the way to the end of the truss, or all the way to the front of the, of the station, uh, coming out of the airlock. In my first TVA, I was all the way to the front, to the very tip of the space station, installing a cover, for example. Thank you very much for answering that question. I must ask you, can you give us a demonstration of zero gravity? I'm sure lots of our viewers would like to see how it works. So I have here things that most people find important. It's, it's a food and a, and a drink. So this is a special food that I will eat uh, next week for an experiment. And the demonstration on zero G is that food is very light on the space station. It's uh, actually it's so light that it floats. And the same for fluids. So this is some orange juice that I uh, rehydrated, and I better get it before it goes all the way to the top. So that's uh, one of the things that we can You've do. You've been in practicing routine. that, Luca. That's very impressive. Fantastic. Well, that leads me on to the it's next question from really our fast. Facebook page. Uh, we have a viewer in Ghana who... <laughs> a viewer in Ghana would like to ask you, what's your favorite food on the ISS? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Actually, the food on the space station is really good. We have all different kinds of food, some provided by the Russians, some provided by uh, the Europeans, others provided by, uh, by the Americans. And uh, we all share this food. But if I have, if I have to add my say, uh, I had some bonus food that was created by, uh, by ESA and the Italian Space Agency uh, for me. Uh, and it, it's, it, it was Italian food. And I say it was because... It, we, we finished it all basically uh, as soon as we found uh, as we found it on the station. We had one big Italian dinner, and I made uh, lasagna, risotto, and all kinds of different specialty. And it was delicious, and everybody was really really happy. <laughs> it's not the same though as when you're back in Italy, I'm sure. And um, I have to tell you, the single question that people are asking the most for you is. Can you give an example of the most important discovery that's been made on the International Space Station? How do you justify all the money that's spent? 
that's a very important question. Um, I would like to go on and to go off and, and say that actually we, the money that we spend on the station is not that much, really. If you put things in perspective, a, a European citizen spends about 10 euros in a year for the, for the space program, which is all the space program, not just the space station and human space flight. But I'll tell you why the money is well spent. On the space station, we do, we do three things that are, that are very important. Uh, one is, of course, the science, and science speaks for itself. It's, it's what makes us different from all the other animals. It's knowledge. Uh, we, are co we, we do uh, at least 30 hours of science a week here on the space station, which generates an incredible amount of more science on the ground. Uh, we do technology where we, uh, we test and create a new technology that then is used uh, on the ground then we do exploration. What I mean is that in the future, thanks to what we are learning today, uh, we will be able to go further away. But to give an example of something that we are doing now that is of uh, uh, immediate effect on the, on, on the ground, we are doing a study on, on how our spine changes when we are in 3G. Oh, to do this, to do this uh, science, we are using a new, a new uh, software in a, uh, for an ultrasound machine, a very small ultrasound machine, to make di uh, diagnosis on our spine. On the ground, the same technology can be used to do diagnosis on the spine in areas that are not easily reachable by big machines like uh, uh, MRIs, or, uh, or uh, uh, tax scan machines. And those machines are huge and expensive, and if you want to go in a remote area and do, and do uh, diagnosis, an ultrasound machine is cheap and uh, inexpensive and very portable. Another one that we're doing, another, another experiment that we're running, a uh, study is osteoporosis. Here in orbit, an astronaut loses bone mass. But we are studying a diet uh, that balances potassium and proteins to figure out what's the best combination to um, diminish, to minimize the loss, of, the loss of calcium from the bones. But imagine if all the millions of people that suffer from osteoporosis could benefit from just a diet rather than uh, cures of, of, uh, or medicine just to improve their, their, their health. I think these, are, these studies are of immediate impact and are just a fraction of what we do on the station. Luca, we really do appreciate your time. I wonder if you could do me a favor. Would you be able to say hello to all of our viewers who use the BBC World News Facebook page to say thank you to them? Absolutely. I would like to, to, uh, to shout out to all the, uh, all the followers on Facebook of the BBC World News. Uh, I'm Luca Parmitano from the International Space Station. And please continue following the news, continue following us. Goodbye, Luca. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Great talking to you. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you, BBC World News. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications. Copy.